Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka welcoming you to another episode of Rural Heritage TV. We've got a real treat for you today as we get a private tour of the historic two-story Julius Neal's Ready Sawmill that's been restored and reconstructed at Lake Itasca, Minnesota. This is believed to be one of the only working band sawmills in the country that has a shotgun feed carriage operated with a steam cylinder. The sawmill has a lot of history and we're going to get that story in another episode, as well as learn about some of the peripheral equipment the volunteers plan to add to the mill, including a multi-blade edger running off the same power line as the bandsaw. But for now, we're going to follow Brian Message, president of the Lake Itasca Region Pioneer Farmers, as he shows us how the bandsaw, log turner, and carriage feed operate. This was the boiler that was purchased um, out in Washington. It was made uh, by uh, Washington Iron Works in 1926. Um, it is a 117 horsepower Scotch Marine style boiler. So a, a boiler horsepower equals 10 square feet of heating surface. Okay. And that's, that's how a, a boiler horsepower is calculated. What makes it a Scotch Marine style boiler is that it's a uh, characteristic of a what's called a large Morrison tube. And our Morrison tube is this big corrugated, hey, how are you? I don't have gloves on, hey, huh? big corrugated opening. Oh, buddy. That runs all the way through longitudinally through long through the boiler, like did, but, and so originally this oh, boiler would have burned uh, probably uh, fuel oil. Okay, it would have had a large gun on the front, and we created and put a 10-foot ash pan in here to, to burn solid fuel. Wow! So the the flame, the fire, and hot gases go back, and then they return through one of uh, 62 four-inch tubes, okay. and then it goes uh, up through the. Uh, the, the stack here okay. and, and out and this ah, okay. and we can show you what that looks like over here so this boiler is uh, while fairly large uh, it doesn't have enough steam generation capacity for the mill we can run the sawmill for about 45 minutes to 60 minutes and then we quite literally run out of steam pun really? intended wow so is that why there's another one over here so this is a boiler that we just picked up uh, about three weeks ago this one came from um, Rushville, Indiana. So this is a hundred horse. Okay. So it's and that's 117. And so okay. this one's just a little bit smaller. Yep. This one's built in 1949 by LaFell, and uh, it should be able to augment our steam generating um, needs uh, quite well. So the goal is to to slide this in next to the new one, or the the old one. Pardon me. And then uh, you know we're going to write some grants because it was going to take considerable amount of money to get all of the steam piping plumbed in here for this. We believe it came out of a, a um, hotel originally. Really? It was a backup boiler for a hotel okay. out of um, Cincinnati. Huh. And then it kind of got shuffled around. Um, the new boiler that we got was set up in Rushville at the, uh, I believe it's the Pioneer Engineers of Indiana. And um, they were gonna hook it up to a stationary engine to their sawmill. And unfortunately, someone came in and stole parts off of their steam engine and it really took the wind out of their sails. It sat for 10 years and they decided to abandon the project. And so um, we were lucky enough to spy it on Facebook and uh, made a deal and got it hauled here. So yeah, very lucky. So um, boiler uh, is heating water to generate steam. Uh, we generate 100, up to 120 PSI worth of steam in this boiler. Um, in this case, we have uh, a four inch line that runs to our large stationary coreless engine okay. and then there's a three inch line that's in insulation here 
that will run over to the auxiliary pieces in the sawmill. That would be our shotgun and our log turner. Okay. The reason for the insulation is we're trying to keep condensation yeah. to a minimum okay. because uh, what condensation is usually bad. It, right. it creates uh, issues in the cylinders and, and whatnot, so we try to uh, okay. stay. So steam is going to come in to our engine here. This is our uh, Murray Corliss steam engine. Uh, it's made in about 1899-1900. It's rated at 340 horsepower. Uh, RPM would be maximum of 100. And, and what is being recorded here is, uh, you know, quite slow. We're just idling by. Uh, we have the governor set up once we come up on the governor to run at about 86 RPM. Um, the dimensions of the engine are a 26-inch bore and a 42-inch stroke. The uh, flywheel is 15 feet in diameter. The flywheel and um, crank and crank disc assembly weighs somewhere around 20 tons. The, um, the reason this is a coreless engine, of course, is the coreless valve gears. And so uh, if you look on the front of the engine here, this would be where the steam chest in, is that the, the valves are, are rotary, essentially. And on a steam engine, unlike a, a in combustion engine, we get to push the piston from both sides. And so your, your steam or intake valves are on the top here, and your exhausts are on the bottom. These are called dash pots. Now, what makes a cordless unique, on top of it being a, a rotary valve, is that rather than throttling the steam, or, uh, that's uh, coming into the engine like a traction engine would. So we're, we're regulating the duration that the valves are open that allow steam into the cylinder. So we have a full 120 PSI of steam available to go into the cylinder at all times, and we just adjust the duration that the valve is open. And so when this governor starts spinning up, the term balls out quite literally means when this starts spinning up quicker, the balls will come out on the governor and it will start picking up on the, the, the black um, tapered cone here. And when that tapered cone starts coming up, it'll adjust these rods and will cause the hooks here to release from the valve sooner. Okay. And um, like I said, it's just centrifugal force that, that then moderates the... Uh, the um, uh, speed of the engine. We can adjust the weight here which counteracts the centripetal force when it starts picking up and the further that we slide the weight out the more weight it puts on it and the faster the engine will turn over before it starts adjusting the valves. The dash pots are, are a pretty neat design too that are part of cordless engines. When when the valve is opening, any anytime the valve opens is when it comes up here and when it gets let go of it gets pulled down very quickly, but it doesn't slam. So these are little vacuum chambers down here. And when the valve gets opened, it's drawing a vacuum. And when it releases, that vacuum pulls the valve back down, but it lets just a little bit of air in underneath to cushion it. And so the, the, they're very efficient because um, we can open and close the valve very quickly and it gives the steam a longer time to actually expand inside of the cylinder. So we're, we're utilizing our, our energy more efficiently, absolutely. So that's why, you know, uh, in late 1800s, in going into the 1900s, most of your large st uh, stationary engines went to a coreless valve design because of the efficiencies that were gained from it. So the sawmill on top of the engine here generating um, power for the sawmill, it also produced electricity for Red Bee and, and Lower Red Lake. And so um, really? in the corner here is the generator. This is a 180 kW generator and we have the belt for it and we have the line shaft. It's not installed yet, but we have the base plate and everything and the goal would be to install the it's about a 14 foot line shaft extension. We've got to make some bearing mounts and, and then uh, some concrete work, but we would be able to set this back up and, and turn it again. So the, the engine turns a uh, 28 inch wide seamless rawhide leather belt. And like Earl alluded to earlier, we believe that it, it could be original uh, to the sawmill. So it'd make that about 122 years old. What does seamless mean? Yeah, there's no splice in it. 
there's no splice in the belt. That was a really big cow. <laughs> it was a really big cow. Yeah. So the the um, the leather is laminated. Okay. Together, and so okay. the the leather is. Um, okay, I see. All right. Wow. Yep. Yep. So the the the, the belt is probably wow. about a half inch thick, three eighths to a half inch thick, and it's laminated into um, into layers, kind of. The engine would have originally turned at about 100 RPM. Okay. Which means the line shaft that it drives would be at 300 RPM. Okay. So I believe it's a 60 inch pulley that the that the engine drives. And if you do the math on that, um, it's an increase of 300%. Uh, and, and from there on our main line shaft there, we, then we then power um, the, the rest of the uh, sawmill, mainly the, uh, the bandsaw, and soon our edger. Okay. But we have other auxiliary equipment, such as a hog, that was used to grind up uh, um, uh, slabs and, um, and trim, trimmings, edgings, um, that would have been ground up into kind of a, not quite sawdust, but chips, and would have been burned in the boilers there. And the boilers they would have had would have been uh, water tube, not fire tube. So these are fire tube boilers. Okay, right, right. Yeah. And they would have had, my understanding was two to three fire tube boilers in Red Beak um, is what they use uh, to, to power that sawmill. So down here, this was one of the things that um, you know was rotted out was our belt tensioner pulley here. So we had to rebuild the timbers, and you know we had rotted wood. So you use that as template the best you can to um, to rebuild. So there's the fulcrum point is down here. We have the original um, concrete weight that was used in the original mill, and then um, like these babbit bearings here. These are all you know, fixed up. We had to melt the babbit out, re-pour them, bore them. Um, we put a new, had to put a new shaft in this particular pulley. This whole thing is floating. Yeah, the whole thing, you know, when the engine guts under load, it starts stretching the belt. Sure. And so you need to be able to take up the slack in the belt. And so what ends up happening is the, acts like a big fulcrum, the weight will go down and it'll take up the slack in the, in the belt. So if I was standing right here, and you were to lift me up about seven feet, that's where I'd be standing operating it. So I have the... Right. And then this side here runs the our shotgun control. This okay. is what runs the carriage back so and forth. So this turns the log, this moves the log forward and back to the saw. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so you can see there's a pedestal and this is where that hooks up to. And I can show you how that gets connected out here. So it comes... That's where we were standing before. Yeah, yeah. It comes into this kind of a bell crank. And then there's this long line here, and this connects to the spool valves on the shotgun, which we can go down and show, and that will open and close the valves and cause the carriage to run back and forth. But while we're under here, um, this is the bottom side of the bandsaw. So the band is 44 feet long, 12 inches wide, uh, has a kerf of a roughly an eighth of an inch, so our kerf would be our width of our teeth here. Um, this backside here is called a sliver tooth. It's not designed to cut anything, um, but it's designed to kind of, um, if there's a sliver on the log and we're bringing the carriage back, rather than bind up, it'll knock it down. And in some cases it will cut it off, but it, it's just there to prevent it from when we go backwards. Um, this is a solid casting, uh, both the bottom and the top wheel are eight foot in diameter. Um, again, these are our, our big Babbitt bearings. Um, these have all been re-poured, and these uh, we've re we re-bored twice. Um, interesting to note is that we have liquid cooling on the bearings from the factory. So there's water jackets uh, on the top and bottom half of these bearings, and these are what these pipes are for. And we circulate cooling water to keep the bearings cold because uh, the the speed at which this travels generates a lot of heat and the babbit will melt out. And that's why we had to do them a second time. We thought we could run for maybe a half hour without the water when we were initially getting the, the sure, sawmill going. Sure, to see if it worked, right. And it turns out you can't. <laughs>
If you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rule yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is fieldwork showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard, feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In Volume 3, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each or you can buy two for $44.95 or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call 1-877-647-2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. So the primary advantage that a bandsaw has over a circle saw is the kerf and the horsepower. So um, for example, a typical circle saw, say a 60 inch diameter saw, such as one that we run at the Bride and Rowan Sawmill and at the, at the Western Minnesota Steam Threshers Union, we have 5 16 wide bits in that saw blade. These are only an eighth of an inch. And so, so it's thinner cut. It's, it's much thinner cut, so you can get um, several more boards out of a log, um, sawing with a thinner curve. It also takes considerably less horsepower because you have less tooth in the saw oh, blade. Right, right. it's doing less work. It's doing less work, exactly right. right. right, right. And so, you know, horsepower requirements are less and uh, you get more production out of it. The, the tricky thing, of course, with a bandsaw back in the day was being able to put the ends together. Yeah. And so they had that Forge pretty- uh, yeah, uh, we still do MIG welding um, okay. to, to weld it together. I'm not sure what they would have used. Yeah. Uh, probably gas welded, I would imagine, imagine. probably back yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, during the turn of the century. But um, yeah, these... Um, these How often do you have to sharpen it? Yeah. To sharpen it? <laughs> so the answer to that is as often as is needed. Okay. So um, <laughs> certainly if we get into some dirty lumber, um, we need to swap out the bands quicker. Um, the other thing that we have to watch out for is these bands will tend to want to work harden in the bottoms of the gullets here. So that band is constantly flexing around the, uh, the band wheels. And that constant flexing uh, causes the, the steel to get hard in the bottom of the gullets. And if it gets too hard without removing it, you'll, gener you'll start getting a crack. And then once a crack starts, it'll want to go all the way across, and then you lose the band. And so uh, it's also important, even if you had a sharp band, to touch it up on the sharpener because it will. Um, you're always taking a little bit out of the gullet um, to prevent that from happening. I would say, generally speaking, probably when this thing was in production, they changed bands every two to four hours. Wow. So Diamond Ironworks in their catalog advertises that a, ba a band on this saw can be changed out in four minutes without loss of time, because that's what they were really right. concerned about. Right, and right, so of this is actually a brake, okay. and so you can lift this up and it pushes a, a, um, a, oh, yeah, um, yeah. a wood block down right. onto the wheel. So right, right. Um, we would kick out the clutch that connects this to the line shaft downstairs, and then a couple beefy guys can come here, put the brake on. And then back when this was in Red Bee in, in, in Cass Lake, the saw shop was a third st story above this. And so what they would have had is they would have slipped the band off onto a carrier and they would have lifted it up into the third story where the saw shop was and then they would have dropped uh, a, a fresh band one. down, slid it on, and then retention it. So the, the way the band stays on the wheel is through tension. So there's a... There's a weighted weight on an arm here, right here, okay? Yep. That weight is pulling down on this, looks like a captain's wheel, it's wanting to rotate it. That rotation wants to pull down on this cable, which then um, pulls down on this arm, which then pushes up on the, uh, on the wheel. Okay. And that's and it, it actually, if you can believe it, that little weight there puts about ten thousand pounds of strain on the on the bandsaw. And we fine tune 
the, the band by adjusting here. And what that does is it lifts and lowers this side independently. So okay. when a band runs on a wheel here, we need the teeth to run off to the side of the wheel. Right. Because right. If, the, if, the, if it ran on the wheel, um, you would mar it all up. Sure. And so we want to maintain, you know, about a three-eighths of an inch of clearance between the gullet and the edge of the wheel. Every band has a little more or less tension in it, and so you, you have to, to fine-tune it when you yeah. slide them on. Yep. How fast does it turn? So uh, as it sits right now, it's about 8,600 feet per minute. Um, at 100 RPM on the engine, it would have been 10,000 feet per minute. And so that's actually a pretty good rule of thumb to use for any saw. So past that, this is the Sawyer station. Um, this controls the, the shotgun. So remember that rod that goes back and forth between the spool valves? Right. This rocks those valves back and forth. Okay. So pulling back towards me will make the carriage go into the cut and then going backwards causes it to go back. And then our, um, our carriage you have the tip of the log turner here that you can see. We looked at the, yep. the rest of it down below. That's kind of the tip of the iceberg. Right. So the tip of that to the floor where they're mounted is 17 feet, four inches. They give you an idea how, how far you know away we are. Yep. And that'll lift up about four to five feet. Okay. Um, carriage is on two rails. It was originally on four. Huh. If you can believe that, we have pictures that show that. One of the other neat things is that it has an axle offset. So when we go into the cut, when we come back, it actually slides the carriage or the log away from the bandsaw. Okay. To prevent to slivers protect and it. stuff to, to, to protect it. Yep, absolutely. Um, and um, the, the shotgun is, is very unique. Like I said, it's the only one in the country that we know of that not only exists, but still runs. Right. And... Um, So this is the, the shotgun here. And so this is the cylinder, and here's the piston rod coming out, and that direct connects to the carriage. And on, on any, any sawmill, you always have a guided rail and kind of a, uh, a flat rail that's non-guided. And um, there's a lot of things, you know, there's water cooling on the top bearings here, and that's what you see all those lines for. This is what's called a speed up roller. We don't have it hooked up yet, but it would speed up and cause the um, the boards to, to leave oh, very yeah, yeah. quickly. Right, right. The um, this would normally be a powered roll case. We wanted to be able to demonstrate the sawmill to our visitors every year without having it 100% complete. So to do that, we put in some temporary roll case to be able to get the boards away from the sawmill. As so eventually, signed. this will be a conveyor. Uh, it'll be a, a, a powered roll case. So it'll be large rollers that are all powered off the line shaft down below. And, and do you have that or do you have to build that? We'll have to build it. Wow. Yeah. But that's what he would have had. And of course, yeah, okay. um, there's, there's uh, plans to put a big green chain going out. Uh, we, need, uh, we don't have something yet, but we need something to trim the boards. Okay. And then yeah. um, there's some other apparatuses um, that we have that we do have. It's called the jack ladder. And we can go out there later and show you. But that, that is used to pull the logs out of the lake into the sawmill. Okay. And um, there's a huge geared mechanism for doing that, okay. and and uh, we've got to build a concrete pond and a bunch of other things to do that. So <laughs> we've gone this far. We might as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're crazy enough to do what you've done to think that you could do it, yep. and you did it. So yeah, you may as well do it all. Yep. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'll have another episode in a few weeks where we talk about the history of the sawmill as well as its future as new components are added to make it as authentically complete as possible. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.